A jury deals another blow to Johnson and Johnson in the fight over talc based baby powder. Another multi million dollar verdict in a baby powder lawsuit. Johnson and Johnson lost its third straight trial over the cancer linked to talcum or baby powder. Is that right? Johnson's will make me feel silky soft. The company may have known for decades that its baby powder sometimes contained asbestos, which can cause cancer. It's a feeling you never outgrow. The company's stock took a hit on the news. Johnson & Johnson has faced several lawsuits of late. The pharmaceutical giant saying it will no longer use talc in its baby powder products sold in the U.S. and Canada. Hey, the Johnson's all smell fresh. Let's see that. Johnson's baby powder from Johnson & Johnson. It'll keep you comfortable. Take it from a baby. So you are Johnson & Johnson in the 1950s a well-reputed company known for addressing and solving the common medical problems of the average citizen. You are the creator of the first aid kit, the Band-Aid, sanitary napkins for women. But your most signature product has to be the Johnson & Johnson baby powder. You have been selling baby powder for almost 60 years now, and it has launched you into becoming a household name. But in the late 1950s, an issue starts creeping in. You notice that the talc coming from your chief mine has traces of tremolite, one of six minerals that come under the asbestos name. Scientists have been reporting for a while that there might be links between asbestos and cancer. But that's not what you are concerned about. I mean, why would you be worried about selling possible cancer-causing powder to infants and mothers? Nothing's set in stone yet. What you are worried about, though, is that the mineral might be making your powder rough. So, to find ways to improve the purity of your talc, you send samples to a private lab. In 1957, Johnson & Johnson sent tons of its talc to a private lab in Columbus, Ohio. And in response, the lab sent a pair of reports in 1957 and 58, which mentioned that the talc contained from less than 1% to about 3% of contaminants, described as mostly fibrous and acicular tremolite. In other words, asbestos. This was the first ever mention of asbestos in talc recorded by Johnson & Johnson. The lab does provide some suggestions and ideas to improve the purity of the talc, but none of them are completely successful. So about six years later, you move on to another approach and purchase completely new mines. You buy three mines in Vermont and within two years start blasting and bulldozing white rock out of the mountains. But just a year later, traces of asbestos start showing up in the Vermont talc too. For heaven's sake, what are you supposed to do now? Mesothelioma has just been linked to asbestos. You can no longer feign ignorance and sell the powder. Hence, just as you are about to resume your search for cleaner talc, William Ashton, your executive in charge of talc supply, comes up with a much more enticing plan. In April 1969, William Ashton sent a memo to the company doctor, saying it was normal to find tremolite in many U.S. talc deposits. He suggested Johnson & Johnson rethink its approach. Historically, in our company, tremolite has been bad, Ashton wrote. How bad is tremolite medically, and how much of it can safely be in a talc base we might develop? To this, the company doctor replied that since pulmonary diseases and cancer appear to be on the rise, it would seem to be prudent to limit any possible content of tremolite to an absolute minimum. The doctor further urged Ashton to consult with company lawyers because it is not inconceivable that we would become involved in litigation. This was the first time that Johnson & Johnson mentioned tremolite as something more than a scratchy nuisance. And things were about to get a whole lot noisier a whole lot quicker. In the early 1970s, medical researchers at Mount Sinai Medical Center came across a curious puzzle. Why were tests of lung tissue taken post-mortem from New Yorkers who never worked with asbestos finding signs of the mineral? The only logical solution they could reach was talcum powder. They knew that talc deposits were often laced with asbestos and any contamination would definitely be affecting the end user. They took their findings to the government and soon a press conference was held. Jerome Kretschmer, New York City's environmental protection chief, announced that it appeared that two unidentified brands of cosmetic talc contain asbestos. Following this, the FDA opened an inquiry. If you're Johnson & Johnson, this is all your nightmares coming true. This announcement had created a panic in the market. You are the most popular cosmetic talc brand, and the public had already started pointing fingers. You couldn't just remain silent, that would make you look guilty. But you couldn't obviously say yes. A better option would be taking a gun and just shooting yourself. You had no other option but to lie. So soon following the inquiry, you issued a statement. 
Our 50 years of research knowledge in this area indicates that there is no asbestos contained in the powder manufactured by Johnson & Johnson. While that was enough to satisfy the public, it was never going to be good enough for the FDA. If the FDA found any traces, it was game over. You hold your breath as they continue to conduct their tests and investigation. And somehow, you catch your luckiest break ever. The FDA's tests did not use the most sensitive detection methods. The talc sample could pass through even if it contained asbestos, and certain forms of asbestos were completely undetectable. Hence, the FDA was unable to find any trace of asbestos in your powder samples. You breathe a sigh of relief. You sit back and relax on your couch and feel like opening your most expensive bottle of whiskey and pouring a drink. And you won't be wrong to do so. After all, that was a hellish experience. But I would definitely recommend not finishing the entire bottle because hell was soon going to come back knocking on your door after a few years. In 1973, the FDA's drug division proposed a rule that talc contained in drugs should not include more than 0.1% asbestos. The FDA's cosmetic division, the division that governed your baby powder, was looking to put up a similar ruling and was asking companies to suggest testing methods. Well, given that your talc is contaminated, you sure as hell are not passing the 0.1% barrier each time successfully. But fear not. You have deceived the FDA before. You might be able to do it again. Since the FDA was asking companies to suggest testing methods, you recommend, and using your power, start pressuring them to adopt the X-ray scanning technique, a technique that allowed an automatic 1% tolerance to asbestos. In a September 6, 1974 letter, Johnson & Johnson told the FDA that since a substantial safety factor can be expected with talc that contains 1% asbestos, methods capable of determining less than 1% asbestos in talc are not necessary to assure the safety of cosmetic talc. But unfortunately, the FDA was not fallen for this one. One official called it foolish, adding no mother was going to powder her baby with 1% of a known carcinogen irregardless of the large safety factor. Well, that plan failed quickly, but such small hiccups are not going to deter you. You have an iron will and never give up, no matter how horrendous your actions are. You get back to work concocting a new plan. And for this one, you start promoting self-policing over regulation. For those who don't know the exact definition of self-policing, it is the process of keeping order or maintaining control within a community without accountability or reference to an external authority. So what you're basically telling the FDA is that there's no need to introduce any regulation, you are as pure as hard as they come, and you are willing and able to regulate yourself in the best interest of the consumers. Well, words aren't going to be enough to convince the FDA, and even you know that. That's why the centerpiece of this plan is going to be a bunch of letters sent to the FDA in 1976. On March 15, 1976, Johnson & Johnson and other manufacturers sent a package of letters to the FDA, showing that they had succeeded at eliminating asbestos in cosmetic talc. The cover letter said, We are certain that the summary will give you assurance as to the freedom from contamination by asbestos for materials of cosmetic talc products. In this letter, Johnson & Johnson said samples of talc produced between December 1972 and October 1973 were tested for asbestos, and none was detected in any sample. What they failed to mention is that in 1974, a test by a professor at Dartmouth College, and in 1975, a test at their own lab, had produced positive results at rather alarming rates. Well, the FDA was fed up with the issue. They had yet to find a suitable testing method, and now these letters had proved that cosmetic talc never had any traces of asbestos. Hence, they decided to postpone their action to limit asbestos in talc. Finally, after years of struggle, you have successfully made the FDA give up. But before starting your celebrations, you want to add the necessary finishing touch. You want to ensure such situations don't arise in the future again. I mean, what if one day a concerned citizen wakes up and starts asking questions about asbestos regulation and talc? He should be provided some kind of an answer to put his mind to ease. How do you do it? Using CTFA, an association formed in the interest of the consumers and chaired by a Johnson & Johnson executive. Using the association, you draft voluntary guidelines establishing a form of X-ray scanning with a 0.5% detection limit as the primary test for checking for asbestos, a method you preferred instead of the more sensitive and better electron microscopy method. Well, now the partying can start. 
You can relax and easily make money off selling powder containing cancer-causing minerals to mothers and infants and still hold a special place in the hearts of millions of families across America. This continued until 21 years later, you faced the first lawsuit from a consumer, Darlene Coker, who claims your talc caused her cancer. Obviously, you deny that, but 21 years after that, in a lawsuit filed by 22 women, you were forced to hand over your internal documents regarding the issue and are eventually slammed with a $4.7 billion verdict over your tainted powder. Johnson & Johnson to this date defends its innocence even after a Reuters investigation which dug up large amounts of incriminating evidence and blames the plaintiff's lawyers for misleading and confusing the juries.